Welcome back. So we're talking about turbulent flows, and today should be a pretty fun lecture. So I'm going to walk you through a lot of examples of turbulence and just great movies and visualizations of turbulent flows, why they're important, how we can use them as engineers, and I'll provide you with some open source resources, codes, and databases in case you're interested in getting started doing research in this field. So I'm pretty excited about this one. I think this is gonna be a lot of fun. And one of the things I love about uh, fluid dynamics and turbulence in particular is all of the great movies and visualizations. Um, so that, that's gonna be kind of fun here. In fact, I'll share with you um, the, the reason I got into fluid dynamics in the first place, at least I joke this, I, I used to do more pure math. Uh, I was sitting in a, in a restaurant with my wife drinking a bowl of miso soup. And I was looking at the patterns, uh, kind of you know, churning patterns of this, this bowl of miso soup, and I thought, boy, this is more interesting than you know, anything I'm working on right now, so I'm gonna go study that. So, you know, this kind of beautiful, uh, visually appealing uh, movie nature of it, I think, is cool. So we're gonna have a lot of that in this lecture. Before I start, I want to um, bring up this quote by Feynman from the Feynman Lectures that has always stuck with me. And I don't expect you to read all of this, um, but I'll, I'll kind of walk you through it. So, the test of science is its ability to predict. Had you never visited the Earth, could you predict the thunderstorms, the volcanoes, the ocean waves, the auroras, the colorful sunset? This is really a statement that even though we know the Navier-Stokes equations, even though I can write down the equations of fluid flows and I can simulate them in a computer, it is very hard for us humans to know before seeing a phenomena whether it exists or whether it's possible. And that's one of the things that's intriguing about physics and fluid dynamics in general is there's a huge disconnect from our equations to all of the richness uh, of reality. Okay, uh, there's another great one here. The next great era of awakening of human intellect may well produce a method of understanding the qualitative content of equations. For example, if I just gave you the Navier-Stokes equations, could you from just the equations know that there are hurricanes? Not today, maybe that's the next great awakening. Anyway, I love this quote. So what we do is we try to understand the complexity of the world through analogies, through examples of simpler building block flows that we might be able to understand. So I've walked you through this a little bit in the previous lecture. There are lots of canonical example flows, and I'm gonna go into every, you know, each of these with a lot more detail in this lecture. We're gonna watch movies and walk through uh, different key aspects of why they're interesting, challenging, uh, and important. So again, wake flows, very important for engineering, uh, mixing layers, um, you know, this comes up everywhere. You'll see this in the cloud sometimes if you look carefully enough. Uh, jets, you know, very impactful. Uh, we live, you know, in the jet age. Okay, so I'm gonna walk through lots of these examples, kind of one by one, and I wanna remind you, of course, that we ultimately want to deal with these very, very complex systems. We're going to analyze them by constituent parts, by these building block pieces. Uh, and eventually, we might want to do something like modeling or controlling these systems. But we have to understand the building blocks first. OK, good. Uh, so pipe flow, a lot of this I already told you in the previous lecture. Uh, a lot of history of fluid dynamics goes back to pipe flows, pumping water through cities. Uh, and so pipe flow is still very important today. There's a really cool uh, video. A lot of these come from the APS Division of Fluid Dynamics Conference. Um, and so you can find these and watch the whole videos. I'm just showing excerpts. Where uh, here they took a pipe and they have these four fans that they can accelerate uh, flow through the pipe to try to control the turbulence, to try to make it more laminar, to change the drag uh, of the fluid going through this pipe. So you see upstream, downstream, here's the perturbed section. And at some point they're gonna turn on this controller here and they're going to, with a perturbation, change the nature of the downstream. So just by, uh, by increasing uh, some property here with these fans, they are making the downstream much more laminar. And presumably this has better profile for things like drag, okay? So this is a really cool example of a canonical flow that has been extremely well studied. There are great researchers who have spent most of their career studying this one canonical flow example. It's stability, it's mathematical properties, it's engineering properties. Good. 
Uh, wake flows. Again, wake flows are super um, ubiquitous everywhere. And it's one of the first flows that we deal with, uh, at least as computational engineers. Often we'll start by modeling something like this, the flow past a cylinder at low Reynolds number. And of course, we're trying to use this as an analog for more complex wake flows, like the wake behind a transport truck or a boat or a plane. This is a turbulent wake um, that was collected experimentally by my collaborator, Richard Zeman at TU Braunschweig. So wake flows are everywhere, very important. If you can control the wake uh, more efficiently, even a little bit, you will save billions, tens, hundreds of billions of dollars annually just by reducing the drag uh, behind transport vehicles, okay? Uh, I couldn't help, this is uh, a pretty cool work, I couldn't help but include this work where uh, these researchers at Imperial College London are actually analyzing the wakes behind fractal geometries. So I showed you, you know, the wake behind a cylinder or a D-shaped body. In this work, they're looking at, sorry, it skipped ahead. In this work, they're looking at um, the wake behind you know, a square, a circle, and then a fractal object. And I think this is super interesting. There are different drag profiles and uh, mixing and turbulence uh, that you can get with these fractal cross-section wakes. And so this is just a really cool uh, avenue of work looking at these things. They actually do this experimentally, which I think is incredibly impressive uh, to get this kind, of, um, this kind of result. So, okay, good. Other examples where wake flows are important, uh, of course, when you're flying commercially, these large, large commercial transport uh, jets will create massive wakes behind them. You see this huge vorticity uh, generated by, by uh, the tip vortex from the wing. This actually has huge impact for airport scheduling. When uh, you know 777 or a 747 takes off or lands, they have to wait for minutes before a smaller aircraft can take off afterwards because that vorticity is so large it could flip a smaller jet. Uh, and things like this have happened. There have been accidents because of wake vorticity. So understanding and characterizing and controlling, mitigating this could have, you know, it could make it so that you take off faster and you can have more uh, aircraft density at airports. Good. Uh, other examples, the boundary layer is one of the most important flows. So this is an experiment. I'm going to rewind just so you see uh, this, uh, the experimental setup. So boundary layers essentially model if you have a flat plate, like let's think of the surface of a wing, how does the flow become turbulent and more and more complex as it accelerates you know, over that wing? And so this is great work um, that I'm going to, again, pull this video from the APS Fluid Gallery where they have experimentally characterized. They experimentally accelerate this, uh, this plate through the water. And you can see that as uh, kind of the flow velocity or the Reynolds number gets higher, the turbulence gets more and more complex and more, uh, and the boundary layer also gets thicker. And so this has implications for the drag on that surface, whether or not the flow will separate, uh, which has huge impacts for lift as well. And these are extremely important quantities to know and to be able to predict when you're designing an aircraft wing, are uh, the mixing and the drag and whether or not the flow is going to separate, because those are all critical for safety and for efficiency. Uh, I like this next video because they're going to put the um, low velocity and high velocity uh, on top of each other. So this is slow and fast. And you can see the change in the nature of the turbulence just by accelerating uh, the flow to higher Reynolds numbers. So here it's much, much more turbulent, but it's also more uniform. Okay, so that again has pretty big uh, implications. Again, you can watch this whole video uh, if you just go through these links. Now, that was experimentally acquired. We also have the ability with high-performance computing to simulate these uh, boundary layers with exquisite detail numerically, so to track every minor eddy and horseshoe vortex across this entire boundary layer at relatively high Reynolds numbers. Uh, so this is um, a Johns Hopkins data set uh, turbulent boundary layer. I think in the previous video, I showed you one from KTH. Um, 
but really you can do pretty amazing things to probe, uh, to probe these flows and get a really high resolution picture. Now what's difficult in simulations that's easy in experiments is getting really long time series. To simulate this flow, one snapshot might be you know, hundreds of megabytes or gigabytes or tens or hundreds of gigabytes. And you know, simulating a short run might take you know, half a million CPU hours or more. I mean, I, I don't know. Off the top of my head, it's a lot. We, but you can get exquisite 3D detail across all of the scales. Whereas in experiments, it's much harder to get the full, you know, detailed view in space and in time, but you can run that experiment for hours and hours and hours and collect statistics of what's happening for very, very long time series. So just uh, in case you're, you're curious, like experiments and simulations are kind of complementary. There are things that simulations can do that experiments can't and vice versa. So they're really, really important to have both of these perspectives. Okay. Uh, cavity flows, I think, are super fun. So a cavity basically is a notch or an empty space where you have flow going over it. And these flows are super interesting. So you have um, a shear layer that's forming here, and there are cavity resonances here that are interacting with that shear layer. And if, you, uh, if the flow is fast enough, you start getting acoustic radiation into the far field and acoustic radiation inside the cavity. Uh, and it turns out cavity flows are really important because if you turn this cavity upside down, it starts to look like the bomb bay doors of, a, of an aircraft. And so I have a video um, I took from Chicagoland Skydiving Center. So the bomb bay doors are opening. Okay, now the inside of this airplane is a cavity. It's resonating, there's recirculating flow, its acoustics are loud. In this case, they're not dropping bombs, they're dropping people. But in any case, the vibrations and the unsteady fluid mechanics from that cavity flow uh, can create huge acoustic vibrations inside of this cavity, which in some cases might even damage what's inside of there. If you have you know, uh, ordinance inside of there, they could be vibrating and banging together and stuff. And so understanding, modeling, and controlling cavity flows is a really important uh, area of fluid dynamics. Actually, this is one of the, the projects that my PhD advisor, Clancy Rowley, worked on early in his career and made some really, really key advances in modeling and understanding and controlling these cavity flows in the uh, compressible regime. Super impressive work. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to keep going because I absolutely love these videos. I love canonical flows. Like this is what I would do in my spare time, you know, on a Saturday morning is just check out a jet. Okay, so this jet is absolutely beautiful. You can again see this multi-scale unsteady uh, nature of this thing. And there's a lot of flavors of jets. This is one of the harder uh, canonical problems because the jets that we care about out of, you know, actual jet engines at uh, subsonic, transonic, and supersonic speeds are very complicated. They're typically compressible, so uh, you know you have uh, density variations. You get acoustic radiation, uh, so acoustic uh, energy is being you know scattered off of this turbulent wake, and it's just a very, very complex, multi-scale, uh, three-dimensional flow. Lots of great people work on jets, and it's one of the kind of hardest and most interesting and very important problems. Again, um, jet noise directly affects tens of millions of humans on Earth, right? So just within the, the Heathrow flight path alone or in the greater uh, Manhattan or New York metropolitan area or Los Angeles, there are tons of people whose lives are directly affected by the noise that's radiated from jets carrying humans and cargo from one place to the other. And so a better ability to model and control and suppress that jet noise would have a direct uh, benefit in, in human lives. I mean, one of the reasons the Concorde wasn't successful was because it was so loud, okay? And it wasn't jet noise in that case, but you know, noise is a big problem. People can only handle so much uh, jet noise. Okay, good. Now, mixing layers, I really like mixing layers um, because this is actually from a dynamical system, from a mathematical standpoint, mixing layers is one of the most interesting uh, kind of to study and to analyze from a stability and dynamical systems point of view. So you can imagine uh, 
following a packet of fluid as it evolves along this, this mixing layer and seeing kind of what bifurcations occur. Because here it's very linear and periodic uh, un unstable instability. Then you get vortex pairing. This is the Kelvin, uh, Kelvin uh, vortex shedding. You get this vortex pairing where the frequency uh, halves, so it's lower frequency. And then you get this vortex breakdown to chaotic uh, kind of turbulent regime in the wake. So very, very interesting stuff happening here. I really like mixing layers. Um, and I've shown you all of these canonical flows. Now I want to show you a really, really complex flow to kind of motivate why you might actually want all of those constituent pieces uh, to understand them. Because in a real flow, you're going to see all of those pieces. Again, this is a really, really cool uh, simulation by the KTH uh, group. Just fantastic fluids researchers. Uh, and I'll actually talk about the code they use to generate this in a little bit. But this is the flow over um, uh, a wing cross-section, so supposed to be a piece of this larger aircraft. And this is a full direct numerical simulation, so they're not approximating anything. They're modeling all of the scales from biggest scale to smallest scale of the entire Navier-Stokes equations. This is a you know, tour de force in modeling to do this direct numerical simulation. Uh, and so they build this computational domain over this airfoil, and soon you're going to see just this incredible complexity of the turbulence evolving. And I'll walk you through how it relates to some of those canonical flows. Okay, so, you know, and they're very careful. They have to be very careful about how they set up the computational domain, the boundary conditions, uh, how many meshes, 35 million core hours, 75 terabytes of data for the simulation. And here is what it leads up to. I love this. This is one of my favorites. So uh, they've tripped the flow to turbulence here with a body force. And you can just see this incredible multi-scale complexity evolving uh, in the boundary layer. So this is the boundary layer flow uh, over kind of the flat or smooth part of this, of this airfoil. So they have this incredible boundary layer with the, the hairpin head vortices and the multi-scale developing uh, and thickening of the boundary layer. At the trailing edge, you'll see trailing edges are usually characterized by mixing layers. Because remember Bernoulli, you have faster flow over the top, slower flow over the bottom. When the fast flow impinges, it creates this mixing layer type flow right in the near wake, formation of a mixing layer. And then as you zoom out and start to go to larger, larger wake scales, you start to see the formation of actual uh, wake structures, just like those bluff body flows. And so that's really cool. In this one flow alone, you have three kind of different canonical flows all interacting and working together. You have your boundary layer flow on the surface, your mixing layer in the near wake, and then you have the kind of Kármán vortex street uh, type wake behavior in the far wake. And all of this is important to understand and to be able to model and predict and control when you want to design and control uh, in real aerospace applications. So very cool. And this is really kind of the state of the art of what's possible. Uh, you know, maybe this was five years ago. So five years later, maybe we can simulate a little bit higher Reynolds number, a little bit more complicated. Uh, but this is pretty, pretty impressive. OK, good. Uh, so I think I've, I've walked through some of my favorite canonical flows and hopefully convinced you that these actually are important. They're challenging. And they culminate. When you put them together, you can start to describe really complex flows. Now I'm going to walk through some of the open resources that are available so that you can get uh, working in this really, really exciting and important field. So one of the ones I use almost all the time is the Johns Hopkins Turbulence Database. Uh, databases. There's multiple databases. This is such a valuable resource in the fluids community. Um, they have tons of different examples from isotropic turbulence, channel flows, uh, magnetohydrodynamics. They have you know, transitional boundary layers. This is an extremely uh, well thought of, well curated, rich, turbulent data set, set of data sets, where you can download this data and start computing things and working on these flows uh, yourself. This is especially useful for those of us who do data-driven methods and machine learning, you know, extracting coherent structures and patterns and trying to build models. This is a playground 
of data. Now, I will warn you, some of these things are pretty hard to download. <laughs> uh, they're pretty big. And so that can, uh, that can get expensive fast. And uh, just giving you one example, this is uh, a video of a visualization of a flow from this turbulence data set. So they're, in this case, um, looking at the multi-scale nature, that every time you zoom into a vortex filament, you're going to see more scales of vortex filaments. Uh, and it's just really cool. Like, you can download this and play around with this yourself, visualize, analyze uh, these flows. So we're going to zoom into this packet here. And look, there's more filaments inside. Uh, so it's truly a multi-scale turbulent data database. Okay, good. Um, there are lots of others. I'll try to put links in the um, in the comments. And you know, in a lot of our papers, we have other resources. So um, there is a data set called HYCOM, H Y C O M, where you can download atmospheric. Sorry, not atmospheric. Sea surface, ocean current data for the entire globe. You can get you know the flow field in the Gulf of Mexico from satellite imaging for decades at uh, hourly resolution. It's incredible. You can um, download the sea surface temperature on the entire surface of the Earth with incredible resolution in space and time. So NOAA and NASA have also released just absolutely phenomenal databases uh, for atmospheric and geophysical flows. Stanford has their own uh, set of databases. So really lots of good resources out there. Uh, codes, let's say you want to generate this data. So downloading data is one thing, but if you want to do control, if you want to do modeling, if you want to do predictions, sometimes you need to actually have the code to generate data dynamically. Okay, so databases are what my colleague Barrett Noack would call post-mortem data analysis. Sometimes we want to analyze the living data in an actual simulation. Uh, one of my favorites, and the one that I use all the time, is this immersed boundary projection method. It's a really quick, easy way to simulate laminar flows. Um, this is based on an algorithm uh, by uh, Tyra and Colonius, and Colonius and Tyra. Um, really cool immersed boundary projection method. And this code is on GitHub by Clancy Rowley. So he developed this IBPM in C++. Very modular, very easy to, um, to modify to make the, the objects move, to add control, uh, to take the Navier-Stokes equations and to analyze individual uh, components of those equations. You know, pull out the linear component, pull out the diffusion term, things like that. So really kind of uh, easy entry point to simulating at least uh, you know, these kind of cool laminar flows, but moving geometries. Another uh, ubiquitous piece of software is OpenFoam. Lots and lots of people use OpenFoam, and you can simulate very, very complex geometries, three-dimensional flows, uh, add in turbulence models. I mean, this is a pretty sophisticated package. One of the ones that uh, my lab likes a lot, and you know, my collaborators use a lot, is this NEC 5000 code uh, that is supported by Argonne National Labs, anl.gov. And so you can uh, download everything here. It's completely open and very well maintained by the government. This has kind of a long memory, so this is going to be maintained for a long time. And again, uh, that flow I showed you by the KTH group, this uh, wing flow, this was simulated in, in NEC 5000 uh, to the best of my knowledge. And so this is like a real research production code where you can go as complex as you want, parallelize. I mean, this is, is heavy duty stuff. And I know that my students and my collaborators um, use this a lot. So very, very cool, cool code. OK, good. Uh, so hopefully I've convinced you that flows are just interesting, really multi-scale. There's kind of these canonical example flows, but real flows have bits and pieces of all of them working together. Uh, and you can actually start simulating and getting your hands dirty with data and with codes yourself. So I highly encourage you to do that. Um, and stay tuned. We're going to have more kind of in this general turbulence and fluid dynamics, uh, machine learning for fluid dynamics. So I'm really excited to see where this all goes. Thank you.